makers of Campbell Soup present the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ernest Chappell. Tonight, the Campbell Playhouse has the signal honor of presenting for its first performance on the air one of the classics of the modern American theater. The winner of the Pulitzer Prize for the best play of 1938, Our Town, by Thornton Wilder. There was much talk when it was first produced in the theater because it was performed without scenery or props. The lovable, garrulous stage manager filling in gaps and explaining things as he went along. Tonight, Orson Welles plays that part. And young John Craven is with us as George, the role he created in the original stage production. Now, before we introduce you to our town, a word from our sponsors. To nearly everyone, it seems to me, the words chicken for dinner have a thrilling sound. They bring thoughts of delightful eating, the kind we associate with holidays and special occasions. Think as far back as you can among your own family's favorite foods or those of any family you've ever visited. Can you remember any dish more widely prized than chicken? But I think this widespread liking for chicken accounts to a large degree for the tremendous popularity of Campbell's chicken soup. And I can promise you that as sure as you like chicken, you'll like Campbell's chicken soup. It's chicken through and through from its golden surface to the very bottom of your plate. Its broth glistens with chicken richness. Its fluffy rice is filled with chicken flavor. And there are tempting tender pieces of chicken meat. During the last five years, people everywhere have discovered how downright good and homey Campbell's chicken soup is. If you haven't tried it, why don't you? Because I'm sure you'll pronounce it every bit as fine as the best chicken soup you've ever had. How about this weekend? And now Orson Welles in Our Town. This uh, play is called Our Town. It was written by Thornton Wilder. In it, you will hear Miss Patricia Newton, Miss Agnes Moorhead, Miss Effie Palmer, Mr. John Craven, Mr. Ray Collins, Mr. Everett Sloan, Mr. Parker Fenley, and uh, many others. The name of the town is Grover's Corners, New Hampshire. It's across the Massachusetts line. Longitude 42 degrees, 40 minutes. Latitude 70 degrees, 37 minutes. First act shows a day in our town. Day is May 7th, 1901. Time is just before dawn. The sky is beginning to show some streaks of light over in the east there. Behind our mountain. Morning star always gets wonderful bright the minute before it has to go. Only lights on in town are in a cottage over by the tracks where a Polish mother's just had twins. And in the Joe Crowell house where Joe Jr. is getting up so as to deliver the paper. And in the depot where Shorty Hawkins is getting ready to flag the 545 for Boston. And there it is. And there it comes now. And so another day begun. There's Doc Gibbs coming down Main Street. Come back from that baby case. Here's his wife coming downstairs to get breakfast. Doc Gibbs died in 1930. New hospital's named after him. Mrs. Gibbs died first, a long time ago, in fact. She went out to visit her daughter, Rebecca, who married an insurance man in Canton, Ohio, and died there, pneumonia. But her body was brought back here. She's up in the cemetery there now, in with a whole mess of Gibbses and Hersey's. She was uh, Julia Hersey before she married Doc Gibbs in the Congregational Church over there. In our town, we like to know the facts about everybody. And that's Doc Gibbs now. Here comes Joe Crow Jr. to live in the papers. Morning, Doc Gibbs. Morning, Joe. Yes, Mr. And here comes Howie Newsom delivering the milk. Yes, Mr. What's the matter with you? Come on. Morning, Doc. Morning, Howie. Hey, somebody sick? There are twins over at Mr. Gorlowski's. Twins, eh? This town's getting bigger every year. Morning, Miss Gibbs. Uh, Morning, Howie. Chicken smells good. Everything all right, dear? Yes, I declare. Easy as kittens. They can be ready in a minute. Sit down, drink the coffee. Uh, Children! Yes, Children! Time to get up, George. Yes, ma'am. Rebecca? Yes, Mama. Didn't catch a couple hours sleep this morning, can't you? Well, Miss Wentworth's coming at 11. I guess I know what's about to. Her stomach ain't what dog be. All told, you won't get more than three hours sleep. Thank Gibbs, I don't know what's going to become of you. Do wish I could get you to go away someplace and take a rest. Think it'd do you good. George! Rebecca, you'll be late for school. Bobby! Emily, you'll be late for school. And that's Mrs. 
Mrs. Webb now, next door to the Gibbses, getting her family up for the day. Well, you wash yourself, go, or I'll come up and do it myself. I'll put away your books, Henley. You know the rules. Well, as I do, no books at table. As for me, I'd rather have my children healthy than bright. I'm both, Mom. You know I am. I'm the brightest girl in school for my age. I have a wonderful memory. I'll eat your breakfast. The Webbses have two children, little Wally and Emily. Emily's 14, and there's two over the way at the Gibbses, Rebecca and George. George is 15. Mama, George is throwing soap at me. I'll come up and slap the both of you. That's what I'll do. We've got a factory in our town, too. Hear it? Makes blankets. Cartwright's on it. It's brung him a fortune. Speak to your father about it when he's rested. Seems to me, 25 cents a week's enough for a boy your age, George Gibbs. I declare I don't know how you spend it all. Oh, Ma, I got a lot of things to buy. Mm, strawberry phosphates, that's what you spend it on. Well, I don't see how Rebecca comes to have so much money. She has more than a dollar. Well, I've been saving it up to gradual. Well, dear, I think it's a good thing every now and then to spend some. Mama, mm. do you know what I love most in the world? Do you? Money. Eat your breakfast. There's the first ball. Oh, no, I'm not fast, but you don't have to run. George, pull up your pants and knee, and don't slow George. Wally, tell Miss Foster I send her my best and best. Mama. Do you remember that? Am I pretty? You look real nice, Rebecca, and I'll pick up your feet. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye. Goodbye, George. Goodbye. Good morning, Julie. Good morning, Myrtle. How's it cold? Well, it's better, but I told Charles I didn't know I'd go to choir practice tonight. Wouldn't be any you. Well, just the same. You come to choir practice, Myrtle, and try it. Well, if I don't feel no worse than I do now, I probably will. <sighs> well, I'm resting myself. I thought I'd string some of these beans. Mm, let me help you. Beans have been good this year. Mm -hmm. I decided to put up 40 quarts if it kills me. The children say they hate them, but I noticed they were able to get them down all winter. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mrs. Gibbs. Thanks, Mrs. Webb. Uh, folks, most every morning, Mrs. Gibbs goes over to Mrs. Webb's, or Mrs. Webb visits Mrs. Gibbs. So we'll just leave them there, visiting, and uh, skip a few hours in the day at Grover's Corners. Well, now, it's the uh, middle of the afternoon. All 2,642 have had their dinners, and all the dishes have been washed. There's an early afternoon calm in our town, a buzzing and a humming from the school buildings, only a few buggies on Main Street, the horses dozing at the hitching post. You all remember what it's like. Doc Gibbs is in his office, tapping people and making him say, ah, and Mr. Webb's cutting his lawn over there. One man in ten thinks it's a privilege to push his own lawnmower. No, sir, it's later than I thought. There are the children come home from school already, and here comes Emily Webb and George Gibbs. Hello. You made a fine speech in class. Well, I was really ready to make a speech about the Monroe Doctrine, but at the last minute, Miss Corkin made me talk about the Louisiana Purchase instead. I worked an awful long time on both of them. Gee, it's funny, Emily. From my window over there, I can just see your head nights when you're over in your room doing your homework. Why, can you? You certainly do stick to it. I don't see how you can sit still that long. I guess you like school. Well, I, I feel it's something you have to go through. Yeah. I don't mind it, really. It passes the time. You're just naturally bright, Emily, I guess. Well, I figure it's just the way a person was born. Yeah. But you see, I want to be a farmer. And my Uncle Luke says whenever I'm ready, I can come over and work on this farm, and if I'm any good, well, I can just gradually have it. You mean the house and everything? Yeah. Hmm. Well, thanks. I better be getting out the baseball field. Thanks for the talk, Emily. Good afternoon, Mrs. Webb. Good afternoon, George. So long, Emily. So long, George. Emily, come and help me string these beans for the winter. George Gibbs let himself have a real conversation, didn't he? Why, he's growing up. How old would George be? I don't know. See, he must be almost 16. Mama, I made a speech in class today, and I was very good. Hmm, you must recite it to your father at supper. What was it about? The Louisiana Purchase. Just like silk off a spool. I'm going to make speeches all my life. Mama... Will you answer me a question, serious? Seriously, not serious, dear. Seriously. Will you? Well, of course I will. Mama, am I good-looking? Yes, of course you are. All my children have got good features. I'd be ashamed if I hadn't. Mama, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, well, what I mean is, am I pretty? I've already told you, yes. Now, that's enough of that. You have a nice, young, pretty face. 
I never heard of such foolishness. Oh, Mommy, you never tell us the truth about anything. I am telling you the truth. Mama, were you pretty? Why, yes, I was, if I do say it. I was the prettiest girl in town next to Mamie Cartwright. But, Mama, you've got to say something about me. Am I pretty enough to get, well, to, to get people interested in me? Emily, you make me tired. Now stop it. You're pretty enough for all normal purposes. Come along now and bring that bowl with you. Oh, Mommy, you're no help at all. We'll have to interrupt again here. Thank you, Mrs. Webb. Thank you, Emily. A lot of time's gone by. It's evening now. You can hear choir practice going on in the congregational church. Hear it? All the children are at home doing their schoolwork by now. Yeah, the day's run down like a tired clock. Emily. Hello. Hello. I can't work at all. The moonlight's so terrible. Emily, did you get the third problem? Which? The third. Oh, why, yes, George. That's the easiest of them all. I don't see it. Can you give me a hint? I'll tell you one thing. The answer is in yards. In yards? How do you mean? In square yards. Oh, in square yards. Yes, George. Don't you see? Yeah. In square yards of wallpaper. Oh, square yards of wallpaper. Thanks a lot, Emily. You're welcome. Ma, isn't the moonlight terrible? Choir practice going on. I think if you hold your breath, you can hear the train all the way to Kantuka. Hear it? How do you know? <laughs> well, I guess I'd better go back and try to work. Good night, Emily. And thanks. Good night, George. Good night, Martha. Good night, Miss Wheelock. Here comes Mrs. Webb, Mrs. Gibbs. Some of their lady friends home from choir practice. I'll tell them, Mr. Webb. I know where you want to put it in the paper. My place. Good night, Irma. Real nice choir practice, wasn't it? Mr. Webb, look at that moon, will you? Hate the weather, for sure. My, I hate to go to bed on a night like this. I'm going to hurry. Those girls will be sitting up for all hours. Good night, Luella. Good night, Sigal. Good night, Susan. Good night, Julia. Good night. Good night. And now, folks, there's some more things we got to explore about this town. This time we're going about it in a, another way going to look back on it from the future. You know, the Cartwright interests had just begun building a new bank in Grover's Corners and had to go to Vermont for the marble, sorry to say. They've uh, asked a friend of mine what they should put in the cornerstone for people to dig up a thousand years from now. Of course, they put in a copy of the New York Times, a copy of Mr. Webb's uh, Sentinel. He's the editor of Sentinel. We're kind of interested in this because some scientific fellows have found a way of painting all that reading matter with a kind of glue... Uh, silicate glue uh, make it keep a thousand uh, two thousand years so we're putting in a bible and a constitution of the United States a copy of William Shakespeare's plays and what do you think you know Babylon once had two million people in it all we know about them is the names of the kings and some copies of wheat contracts and sales of slaves Yet every night, all those families sat down to supper, and the father came home from his work, and the smoke went up the chimney. Same as here. And, and even in Greece and Rome, all we know about the real life of the people is what we can piece together out of the joking poems and the comedies they wrote for the theater back then. So, I'm going to have a copy of this play put in the cornerstone, and the people a thousand years from now know a few simple facts about us. More in the Treaty of Versailles and the Lindbergh flight. See what I mean? Well, you people a thousand years from now, in the provinces north of New York at the beginning of the 20th century, people ate three meals a day, soon after sunrise, at noon, and at sunset. Every seventh day, by law and by religion, was a day of rest, and all work come to a stop. Domestic setup was marriage binding relation between a male and one female that lasted for life. Guess we don't have to tell you about the government and business forms, because thing people seem to hand down, first of all. 
Let me see now if there's anything else. Oh, yes. At death, people were buried in the ground just as they are. So, friends, this is the way we were in our growing up and in our marrying and in our doctoring and in our living and in our dying. And now we'll return to our day in Grover's Corners. A lot of time's gone by. There's uh, George up there in the window talking with Rebecca. Get out, Rebecca. There's only room for one at this window. You're always spoiling everything. Well, let me look just a minute. Well, use your own window. I did, but there's no moon there. George, do you know what I think? Do you? I think maybe the moon's getting nearer and nearer. And there'll be a big explosion. Well, Becky, you don't know anything. If the moon were getting nearer, the guys that sit up all night with telescopes would see it first. And they'd tell us about it. And it'd be in all the newspapers. George, is the moon shining on South America, Canada, and half the world? Well, probably is. Well, well, folks, there it is. Another night, Grover's Corners. There they are. 9.30. Most of the light's out. And now there's Constable Warren trying a few doors on Main Street. And uh, here comes Editor Webb after putting his newspaper to bed. All right, Editor Webb. Evening, Bill. Evening, Mr. Webb. Right moon. Yeah. Right, Mr. Webb. Who's that up there? Is that you, my room? No, it's me, Papa. Why aren't you in bed? I don't know. I just can't seem to sleep yet, Papa. The moonlight's so wonderful. And the smell of Mrs. Gibbs' heliotrope. Mmm. Can you smell it? Yeah. Mm. Have any troubles on your mind, have you, Emily? Troubles, Papa? No. Well, enjoy yourself. We'll let your mother catch you. Night, Emily. Good night, Papa. I never told you about that letter Jane Crawford got from her minister when she was sick. The minister of her church in the town she was in before she came here. He wrote Jane a letter. And on the envelope, the address was like this. It said, Joan Crawford, the Crawford Farm, Grover's Corners, Sutton County, New Hampshire, United States of America. What's funny about that? Well, but listen, it's not finished. The United States of America... Continent of North America, Western Hemisphere, the Earth, the Solar System, the Universe, the Mind of God. That's what it said on the envelope. Oh, what do you know? And the postman brought it just the same. What do you know? That's the end of the first part of our broadcast, friend. Second part will begin in just a minute. are listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Thornton Wilder's Pulitzer Prize play, Our Town, starring Orson Welles. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Ernest Chappell, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. And in a moment or two, we will resume our presentation of Thornton Wilder's Pulitzer Prize play, Our Town. While Orson Welles was taking us through the streets and byways of our town, I fell to thinking of everybody's hometown and the changes that have taken place there. Not only the physical changes and the new faces, but the changes in habits. For instance, not so many years ago, people discovered the joy and refreshment and health benefits of drinking tomato juice at breakfast. Well, that was certainly a change for the better in the eating habits in my town and yours. Then there was a time when women felt that only homemade chicken soup was good enough for their families. Well, this too has changed, for people have discovered the same good chicken eating in Campbell's chicken soup as in the best of homemade soup without the fuss and bother of preparing it. It's evident that a great many families have found out how good Campbell's chicken soup really is because we're called upon to make more and more of it. 
Have you had it lately? Now we resume our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Thornton Wilder's Pulitzer Prize play, Our Town, starring Orson Welles with John Craven. Well, folks, three years have gone by. Yes, the sun's come up over a thousand times. Summers and winters have cracked the mountains a little bit more, and the rains have brought down some of the dirt. Some babies that weren't even born before have begun talking regular sentences already. A number of people who thought they were right young and spry have noticed that they can't bound up a flight of stairs like they used to without their heart fluttering a little. Some older sons are sitting at the head of the table, and some people I know are having their meat cut up for them. All that can happen in a thousand days. Nature's been pushing and contriving in other ways, too. A number of young people fell in love and got married. Yes, mountain got bit away a few fractions of an inch. Millions of gallons of water went by the mill, and here and there a new home was set up under a roof. Almost everybody in the world gets married, you know what I mean? In our town, there aren't hardly any exceptions. Most everybody in the world climbs into their graves married. So, it's three years later, it's 1904, July 7, just after high school commencement. That's the time most of our young people jump up and get married. As soon as they pass their last examinations in solid geometry and Cicero's orations, looks like they suddenly feel themselves fit to be married. It's early morning. There, you can hear the 545 of Boston. Here comes Howie Newsom delivering the milk. There's Mrs. Gibbs and Mrs. Webb come down to breakfast. Just though it were an ordinary day. I don't have to point out to the women in my audience that both these ladies cook three meals a day. One of them for 20 years, the other for 40 no summer vacation. Brought up two children apiece, washed, cleaned the house, and never a nervous breakdown. Never thought themselves hard used, either. Well, Ma, days come. You're losing one of your chicks. Thank you. Don't you say another word. I feel like crying every minute. Sit down, drink your coffee. Huh. Groom's up shaving himself, whistling and singing like he's glad to leave us. Hmm. Every now and then he says, I do, to the mirror. But it don't sound convincing to me. Mm. What? Why, Julia Hersey. French toast. Mm. Ain't hard to make, and I had to do something. I remember my wedding morning, Julia. Now, don't stop that, Frank Gibbs. I tell you, I can't stand it. I was the scaredest young fellow in the state of New Hampshire. I thought I'd made a mistake, for sure. Mm. And when I see you coming down that aisle, I thought you was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. But the only trouble was, I'd never seen you before. There I was in the Congregational Church, marrying a total stranger. How do you think I felt? Good morning, everybody. Only four more hours to live. Where are you going? Just across the grass to see my girl. Now, George, you take my girl. I won't let you out. Good morning, Mr. Webb. Well, George, how are you? I'm fine. Mr. Webb, do you believe in superstitions? Well, what superstition, George? You know, about a bride and groom not being supposed to see each other on a wedding morning? Well, you see, uh, on a wedding morning, the girls' heads have to be full of clothes and things like that. Don't you think that's probably it? Uh, yes. I never thought of that. Girls have to be a mite nervous on a wedding day. I wish a fella could get married without all that marching up and down. Well, the man that's ever lived felt that way about it, George. Hasn't done much good. It's the women that have built up weddings, my boy. From now on, they have it pretty much their life. All those good women standing shoulder to shoulder, making sure that they're not tied in a mighty public way. You believe in it, don't you, Mr. Webb? Oh, yes. Oh, you, don't you misunderstand me, my boy. Marriage is a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. Don't forget that, George. No, sir. Mr. Webb, how old were you when you got married? Well, you see, I'd been to college. I'd take a little time to get settled. But Mrs. Webb, she wasn't much older than what Emily is. Oh, Age has much to do with it, George. Not compared to other things. George, I was thinking the other night of some advice my father gave me when I got married. <clears throat> Charles is in. Charles, start out early showing who's boss, he said. Best thing to do is to give an order, even if it don't make any sense. Just so she'll learn to obey. And, he said, if anything about your wife irritates you, her conversation or anything, just get up and leave the house. That'll make it clear to her, he said. And, oh, yes. He said, never, never let your wife know how much money you have. Never. Mr. Webb, 
I don't So I took the opposite of my father's advice, and I've been happy ever since. But that'd be a lesson to you, George. Never to ask advice on personal matters. George, you gonna raise chickens on your farm? What? You gonna raise chickens on your farm? Well, Uncle Luke hasn't gone in much of chicken raising. Brooke came into my office the other day, George, on the philo system of raising chickens. I want you to read it. Charles, are I'm you think... talking about that old incubator again? I thought you two would be talking about things worthwhile. Good morning, George. Well, Murder, if you want to give the boys some good advice, I'll go upstairs and leave you alone with them. Oh. Now, George, I, I'm sorry, but I've got to send you away so that Emily can come down and get some breakfast. She told me to tell you that she sends her love, that she doesn't want to lay eyes on you. So, uh, goodbye, George. Murder, I guess you don't know about that uh, other superstition. What, what do you mean, Charles? Since the cavemen... The groom should never be left alone with his father-in-law on the day of the wedding, or near it. Now, don't forget that. Now, I have to interrupt again here. You see, we want to know how all this began, this wedding, this plan to spend a lifetime together. I'm awfully interested in how big things like that begin. You know how it is. You're 21 or 22, you make some decisions, then you're 70. You've been a lawyer for 50 years, and that white-haired lady at your side has eaten over 50,000 meals with you. How do such things begin? George and Emily are going to show you now the conversation they had when they first knew that uh, the saying goes they were meant for each other. Before they do it, I want you to try and remember what it was like when you were young, when you were 15 or 16. For some reason, it's very hard to do those days when even the little things in life could be almost too exciting to bear. And particularly, days when you're first in love. When you're like a person sleepwalking and you didn't quite see the street you were in. Didn't quite hear everything that was said to you. Just a little bit crazy. Will you remember that, please? Now, they'll be coming out of high school at 3 o'clock. George just been elected president of the junior class and it's June. That means he'll be president of the senior class all next year. And Emily's just been elected secretary of treasury. I don't have to tell you how important that is. All right, George. Can I carry your books home for you, Emily? Thank you. I'm awful glad you were elected too, Emily. Thank you. Emily, why are you mad at me? I'm not mad at you. You're treating me so funny. Well, I might as well say it right out, George. I don't like the whole change that's come over you in the last year. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but I just got to tell the truth and shame the devil. I'm awfully sorry, Emily. What do you mean? Well, up to a year ago, I used to like you a lot, and I used to watch you as you did everything, because we'd been friends so long, and, and then you started spending all your time playing baseball, and you never even spoke to anybody anymore, not even to your own family you didn't. And, George, it's a fact you got awful conceited and stuck up, and all the girls say so. They may not say so to your face, but that's what they say about you behind your back, and hurts me to hear him say it, but i got to agree with him a little. And, well, I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings, but I can't be sorry I said it. I'm glad you said it, Emily. I never thought that such a thing was happening to me. I guess it's hard for a fellow not to have some faults creep into his character. I always expect a man to be perfect, and I think he should be. Well, I don't think it's possible to be perfect, Emily. Well, my father is. As far as I can see, your father is. There's no reason on earth why you shouldn't be, too. Emily, I feel it's the other way around. That men aren't naturally good, but girls are. Like you and your mother and my mother. Well, you might as well know right now that I'm not perfect. Not as easy for a girl to be perfect as a man because... Well, because we girls are more nervous. Now, I'm sorry I said all that about you. I don't know what made me say it. No. I guess if it's the truth, you ought to say it. You stick to it, Emily. Well, I don't know if it's the truth or not, and I suddenly feel it isn't important at all. Emily, would you like an ice cream soda or something before you go home? Well, thank you. I, I would. Hello, George. Hello, Emily. Well, what do you have? Why, Emily Webb, what have you been crying about? Oh, she's got an awful scare, Mr. Morgan. She almost got run over by that hardware store wagon. Everybody always says that Tom Huckins drives like a crazy man. Well, here, take a drink of water, Emily. Let me see. Say, you look all shook up. There. Well, now, what do you have? I have a strawberry phosphate, thank you, Mr. Morgan. No, no, Emily. Have an ice cream soda with me. Two strawberry ice cream sodas, Mr. Morgan. Yes, sir. 
Hell, yeah. You know, you've got to look both ways before you cross Main Street these days. It gets worse every year. 125 horses and go over corners this minute that I'm talking to you. They inspect it was in here yesterday. And now they're bringing in these automobiles. Best thing to do is just stay home, I guess. Why, I can remember the time when a dog could lie all, all day in the middle of Main Street and nothing would come along to disturb him. Oh, yes, Miss Alice. I'll be with you in a minute. Now, well, here are your sodas. Well, enjoy them. They're so expensive. No, no, don't think of that. We're celebrating. First, we're celebrating our election. And then, do you know what else I'm celebrating? No. Uh, I'm celebrating because... I've got a friend who tells me everything that ought to be told me. George, please don't think of that. I don't know why I said it. It's not true. No, you stick to it, Emily. I'm glad you spoke to me the way you did. But you'll see. I'm going to change so quick. But I'm going to change. And Emily, I want to ask you a favor. What? Well, if I go away to State Agriculture College next year, will you write me a letter once in a while? I certainly will. I certainly will, George. It certainly seems like being away three years, you get out of touch with things. Yeah. You know, Emily, whenever I meet a farmer, I ask him if he thinks it's important to go away to agriculture school to be a good farmer. Why, George. Yeah, and some of them say that it's even a waste of time. And Uncle Luke's getting old. He's about ready for me to start in taking over his farm tomorrow if I could. My. And like you say... Being gone all that time, meeting other people in other places. If anything like that can happen, I don't want to go away. I guess new people aren't any better than old ones. I'll bet you they almost never are. Emily, I feel that you're as good a friend as I've got, and I don't need to go to other towns to meet other people. Emily, I'm going to make up my mind right now. I won't go. I'll tell Pa about it tonight. Why, George... I don't see why you have to decide right now. It's a whole year away. Emily, I'm glad you spoke to me about that. That fault in my character. What you said was right. But there was one thing wrong in it. That was where you said that I wasn't noticing people. And you, for instance. Listen, Emily. You say you were watching me when I did everything. Why, I was doing the same thing about you all the time. Sure. I always thought about you as one of the chief people I thought about, and I always made sure where you were sitting in the bleachers and who you were with, and we've always had lots of talking and joking and everything, and they meant a lot to me. Of course, they weren't as good as the talk we're having now. Lately, I've been noticing that you've been acting kind of funny to me, and for three days I've been trying to walk home with you, but something's always gotten away. Yesterday, I was standing over by the wall waiting for you, and you walked home with Miss Cochran. George. Life's awful funny. How could I know that? Well, I Listen, thought... Listen, Emily, I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to go away to agriculture college. I think that once you've found a person you're very fond of, well, that is, who's fond of you, too, at least enough to be interested in your character, well, I think that that's just as important as college is, even more so. That's what I think. Now, I think it's awfully important, too. Emily. Yes, George? Emily, if I do improve and make a big change, would you be... Well, that is... Could you be... I am now. I always have been. Oh, I guess this is an important talk we've been having. Yes. <clears throat> now, before we go on to the wedding, there are still some more things we ought to know about this marriage. I want to know some more about how the parents took it, but what I want to know most of all is, you know what I mean, what Grover's Corners thought about marriage anyway. Julia, when I married you, you know what one of my terrors was in getting married? Oh, sure. Go on with you. I was afraid that we weren't going to have material for conversation more than would last us just a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, I was afraid we'd run out, eat our meals in silence. In fact, but... You and I have been conversing for 20 years now without any noticeable barren spells. Well, good weather, bad weather. Ain't very choice, but always manage to find something to say. What do you think? What do you think, Julia? Shall we tell the boy that he can go ahead and get married? Oh, there you go, putting the responsibility on me. 
Yeah. Uh, I'll go up. I'll go up and say a word to him right now before he goes to bed, huh? Yeah. You're sure, Julia? You got nothing more to add? Well, I, I don't know what to say. Seems like too much to ask for a big outdoor boy like that to go and get shut up in the classrooms for three years. Once he's on the farm, he might just well have companions. He needs to find a fine girl like Emily. Huh? People are meant to live two by two in this world. Oh, yes, Frank, go, go up and tell him it's all right. Yeah, yeah, I'll call him. George? Oh, George? Yes, Pa? Can you come down a minute? Your mother and me want to speak to you. Yeah, sure. Oh, Lord, what a fool I am. I'm, I'm trembling all over. Nothing to tremble about. Now we're ready to go on with the wedding. Some churches say that marriage is a sacrament. I don't know what that means, but I can guess. You know, like Mrs. Gibbs said just now, people were made to live two by two. Now, this is a good wedding, but people are so put together that even at a good wedding, there's a lot of confusion way down deep in people's minds. And we thought that that ought to be in our play, too. Why on earth I should be crying? There's nothing to cry about. Come over me at breakfast this morning. There was Emily. Eating her breakfast as she's done for 17 years. And now she's going off to eat it in someone else's house. Mm. I suppose that's it. There they come. I wish I were back at school. I don't want to get married. George, what's the matter? Oh, I don't want to grow old. Why is everybody pushing me so? Why, oh, George, you wanted it. Why do I have to get married at all? Listen, Ma, for the last time I George, ask you... George, if anyone should hear me, now stop. Well, I'm ashamed of you. What's the matter? I've been dreaming. Where was Emily? Gracious, you gave me such a turn. Oh, cheer up, Ma. What are you looking so funny for? Cheer up. I'm getting married. Let me catch my breath a minute. No, Ma. You say Thursday nights. Emily and I are coming over to dinner every Thursday night. You'll see. <laughs> What are you crying for? Oh, we've got to get ready for this. I've never felt so alone in my whole life. And George over there looking so... I hate him. I wish I were dead. Oh, Papa. Emily, Emily, now. Don't get upset. Oh, Papa, I don't want to get married. Emily, everything's all right. Oh, why can't I stay for a while just as I am? Let's go away. No, no, Emily, no. Stop and think. But don't you remember that you used to say... All the time you used to say that I was your girl. He must be lots of places we can go to. Let's go away. I'll work for you. I can keep house. Uh, you mustn't think of such things. You're just nervous, Emily. Now, now, you're marrying the best young fellow in the world. George is a fine fellow. Oh, but Papa... George? George. Yes, Mr. Graham. You're giving away my daughter, George. You think you can care for her? Mr. Webb, I want to... I want to try. Emily, I'm going to do my best. I love you, Emily. I need you. So, if you love me, help me. All I want is someone to love me. I will, Emily. If I'm ever sick or in trouble, that's what I mean. Emily, I'll try. I'll try. But I mean forever. Do you hear? Forever and ever. Wait. Right. Wait. Uh, do you, George, take this woman, Emily, to be your wedded wife? <laughs> To live together after God's ordinance, the holy estate of matrimony with our lover, comforter, honor, and keeper in sickness and in health and forsaking all others. Keep the only unto us so long as he both shall live. Answer now, George. I do. Don't know, Finn. I've seen such a... You, Emily, take this man, George, in the state of matrimony with our lover, comfort him, honor him, keep him in sickness and in health and forsaking all others. Keep the only unto us so long as he both shall live. Answer, Emily. I do. Married 200 couples in my day. You should get it wrong. Do I believe in it? I don't know. M marries N. Millions of them. 
Cottage, the go-kart. Sunday afternoon drives in the Ford. The first rheumatism, the grandchildren, the second rheumatism. Deathbed, reading the will. Once in a thousand times, it's interesting. Well, let's have Mendelssohn's wedding march. Friends, summer 1913. Gradual changes in Grover's Corners. Horses are getting rarer and farmers coming into town in Fords. Everybody locks their house doors now at night. Ain't been any burglars in town yet, but everybody's heard about them. You'd be surprised, though, on the whole. Things don't change much at Grover's Corners. We're up at the cemetery now. I don't know how you feel about such things, but this certainly is a beautiful place. It's on a hilltop. Windy hilltop, lots of sky, lots of clouds, often lots of sun and moon and stars. Come up here on a fine afternoon, you can see range on range of hills. Awful blue they are up there by Lake Sunapee, Lake Winnipesaukee. Way up, if you've got a glass, you can see the White Mountains. Mount Washington, where North Conway is. And Conway, of course, our favorite mountain. Right here, all around it. Jaffrey... Other towns, East Jaffrey and Peterborough, Dublin, they are quite a ways down as Grover's Corners. Yes, yeah, beautiful spot up here. Mountain laurel and lilacs. I often wonder why people like to be buried in Woodlawn, Brooklyn, when they might pass the same time up there in New Hampshire. Over there, the old stone, 1670, 1680, strong minded people that come a long way to be independent. Over there, some Civil War veterans, too. Iron flags on the graves. New Hampshire boys. Had a notion that the Union ought to be kept together, though they'd never seen more than 50 miles of it themselves. All they knew was the name, friends. The United States of America. The United States of America. Went and died about it. Now, this here is the new part of the cemetery. Here's your friend, Mrs. Gibbs. Remember her. Let me see. Here's Mr. Stimson, organist of the Congregational Church. And over there is Mrs. Soames, who enjoyed the wedding so much. A lot of this. Editor Webb's boy, Wallace, whose appendix burst while he was a Boy Scout. Went on a trip to Crawford Notch. <laughs> well, there's some living people. There's Joe Stoddard, our undertaker over there, supervising a new-made grave. Here comes a Grover's Corners boy that left town to go out west. Afternoon, Joe Stoddard. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, let me see. Do I know you? I'm Sam Cray. Gracious sakes alive of all people. Well, I should have known you'd be back for the funeral. Well, you've been away a long time, Sam. Yeah, I've been away over 12 years. I'm in business out in Buffalo now, Joe. But I was in the East when I got news of my cousin's death, so I thought I'd kind of combine things a little and come and see the old home. Yeah, well, you look well. Yes, I can't complain. Well, it's a sad journey for us today, Samuel. Yep. Yes, I always say I hate to supervise when a young person is taken. Why, right, there's old Farmer McCarthy. I didn't know he was gone. He used to do chores for him after school. He had lumbago. Yes, we brought Farmer McCarthy here a number of years ago now. Why, right. this is my Aunt Julia. Yes. Doc Gibbs lost his wife two or three years ago, just about this time. The day's another bad blow for him, too. Joe, what did she die of? Who? Why, my, my cousin, Emily. Oh, didn't you know? Had some trouble bringing a baby into the world. Let's see, today's Friday. It's almost a week ago now. Did the baby live? No. It was her second, though. There's a little boy, about four years old. Now, I'm going to tell you some things you know already. You know them as well as I do, but you don't take them out and look at them very often. I don't care what they say with their mouths. Everybody knows that something is eternal. It ain't houses and it ain't names. It ain't earth. It ain't even the stars. Everybody knows in their bones that something is eternal and that that something has to do with human beings. All the greatest people ever lived have been telling us that for 
Oh, I don't know how long they've been telling us. 5,000 years, and yet you'd be surprised how people are always losing hold of it. Something way down deep that's eternal about every human being. You know as well as I do that the dead don't stay interested in us living people very long. Gradually, gradually they let hold of the earth. And the ambitions they had and the pleasures they had and the things they suffered and the people they loved. They get weaned away from earth. That's the way I put it. Weaned away. Yeah. They stay here while the earth part of them burns away, burns out. And all that time, they slowly get indifferent to what's going on in Grover's Corners. They're waiting. They're waiting for something that they feel is coming, something important and great. Aren't they waiting for the eternal part in them to come out clear? Some of the things they're going to say maybe will hurt your feelings. That's the way it is. Mother and daughter. Husband and wife. Enemy and enemy. Money and miser. All those terribly important things kind of grow pale around here. And what's left? What's left when memory's gone? And your identity, Mrs. Smith. Who is it, Julia? My daughter-in-law, Emily West, will I declare. What did she die of, Julia? In childbirth, childbirth. I'd forgotten all about that. My, wasn't life awful and, and wonderful. Hello. Hello, Hello Emily. Emily. Hello, Mother Gibbs. Hello, Mother Gibbs. Emily. Hello. It's raining. Yes. They'll be gone soon, dear. It seems thousands and thousands of years since I... How stupid they all look. They don't have to look like that. Don't look at them now, dear. They'll be gone soon. They sort of shut up in little boxes, aren't they? I feel as though I knew them last a thousand years ago. My little boy is spending the day at Mrs. Carter's. Oh, oh, Mr. Carter, my little boy is spending the day at your house. Is he? Yes. Yes. Look, Father Gibbs is bringing you some of my flowers. He looks just like George, doesn't he? Mother Gibbs, I never realized before how troubled and how in the dark life persons are. That's all they are from morning till night. Just trouble. Mother Gibbs, one can go back. Uh, one can go back there again, into living. I feel it. I know it. Why, just then for a moment I was thinking about, about the farm. And, and for a minute I was there. And my baby was on my lap as plain as day. Yes, of course you can. I can go back there and live all those days over again. Why not? All I can say is, Emily, Yes, some have tried. They soon come back here. Don't do it, Emily. Emily, don't. It's not what you think it'd be. But I won't live over a sad day. I'll choose a happy one. I'll choose the day I first knew I loved George. Why should that be painful? You not only live it, but you watch yourself living it. Yes. And as you watch it, you see the thing that they down there never know. You see the future. You know it's going to happen afterwards. I'll choose a happy day anyway. No. At least choose an unimportant day. Choose the least important day in your life. It will be important enough. Then it can't be since I was married or since the baby was born. I can choose a birthday at least, can't I? I choose my 12th birthday. All right. February 11th, 1899, Tuesday. Do you want any special time of day? Oh, I want the whole day. We'll begin at dawn. Remember, it had been snowing for several days, but it stopped the night before, and they'd begun clearing the roads. Sun's coming up. There's Main Street. Why, that's Mr. Morgan's drugstore before he changed it. And there's the livery stable. Yes, it's 1899. Fourteen years ago. Look, there's High Newsom. There's our policeman. But he's dead. He died. 
ready when you want it. Oh, and Charles, don't forget, it's Emily's birthday. You remember to get her something? Yes, that's something here. Where's my girl? Where's my birthday girl? Well, don't interrupt her now, Charles. You can see her at breakfast. She's slow enough as it is. Hurry up, children. It's seven o'clock. Now, I don't want to call you again. I can't bear it. They're so young and beautiful. Why did they ever have to get old? Mama, I'm here. I'm grown up. I love you all. Everything. I can't look at everything hard enough. There's the butternut tree. There's Mr. Morgan's drugstore. And there's the high school forever and ever and ever. And there's the congregational church. Oh, I don't have it. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, I... Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Mama. Well, now, dear, a very happy birthday to my little girl and many, many happy returns. There's some surprises waiting for you on the kitchen table. <laughs> that and the blue paper is from your Aunt Carrie. And I reckon you can guess who brought the postcard album. Found it on the doorstep when I brought in the milk. George Gibbs. Must have come over in the cold pretty early. Right nice of him. George, I'd forgotten that. Now, chew that bacon slow. It'll help keep you warm on a cold day. Oh, Mama, just look at me once as, as though you really saw me. Mama, 14 years have gone by. I'm dead. You're a grandmother, Mama. I married George Gibbs, Mama. And Wally's dead, too. Mama, here's appendix first on a camping trip to North Conway. We felt just terrible about it. Don't you remember? But just for a moment, now we're all together. Mama, just for a moment, we're happy. Let's look at one of That the yellow paper is something I found in the attic among your grandmother's things. You're old enough to wear it now, and I thought you'd like it. Your father has a surprise for you, too. Don't know what business is myself. Where's my girl? Here he comes. Somebody's setting up late and talking. That's yeah, clearing up. There are the stars doing their old crisscross journeys in the sky. Scholars haven't settled the matter yet, but they seem to think there are no living beings up there. Just chalk, uh, fire. Only this one is straining away, straining away all the time to make something out of itself. Strain so bad that every 16 hours everybody lies down and gets rest. Yeah, it's 11 o'clock in Grover's Corners. 
You get a good rest, too. Good night. This concludes the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Our Town by Thornton Wilder, starring Orson Welles with John Craven. In just a moment, Mr. Wells will return to the microphone, but first a word on behalf of our sponsors. Earlier this evening, I promised you you'd find Campbell's chicken soup every bit as good as the finest chicken soup you've ever tasted. I'll go further than that. I believe you'll find it even better. And I say this for two reasons. First, because thousands and thousands have welcomed Campbell's chicken soup with downright enthusiasm and are now serving it regularly. Second, because I've seen how Campbell's chicken soup is made. Campbell's use all the good meat of plump, government-inspected chickens. Long and slowly they simmer the broth till it attains a glistening golden color, till every drop is rich with chicken flavor. Light, fluffy rice is added, and to complete your enjoyment, tender pieces of chicken meat. I'm sure you'll be delighted with Campbell's chicken soup. Enjoy it this weekend. And now, if you please, Mr. Wells, will you tell us about next week's story? Well, ladies and gentlemen, next week, what transpires is an entertainment called The Bad Man, for which purpose I am luring in the character of Pancho Lopez, the brigand, the beautiful Miss Ida Lupino, all the way from Hollywood into my fiendish clutches, and a good time, I think, will be had by all, anyway, until next Friday night. Until The Bad Man, hurriedly, our sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us in the Campbell Playhouse remain obediently yours. <laughs> Makers of Campbell Soups join Orson Wells in inviting you to be with us at the Campbell Playhouse again next Friday evening when lovely Ida Lupino of the screen joins him in that fabulous stage hit of the 1920s, The Bad Man, a story of love and laughter in old Mexico with Orson Wells himself as a bold and not over-successful bandit. Meanwhile, if you have enjoyed tonight's Campbell Playhouse presentation, won't you tell your grocer so tomorrow when you order Campbell's chicken soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.